Attention, soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and coasties. The holiday season is right around the corner. And some of you might be wondering, how am I going to afford to travel back home to visit my loved ones? Have no fear. Holidays for the Heroes is here. Last year, Holidays for the Heroes received donations from patriotic donors, and we were able to send 65 armed service members with a fully paid round-trip ticket and got them home for the holidays. Wait, but what's the catch, you might ask? Buckle your parachute strap. There is no catch and no hidden fees. Just contributions from good old-fashioned Americans who want to help heroes like you and show their appreciation for your service. If you're an active soldier and want to register, or an individual who wants to be a part of that growing group of patriotic donors, please go to www.holidaysfortheheroes.org. That's www.holidaysfortheheroes.org. Come to you from underneath the peach blossom. It's time for an episode of Be Awesome. Find positivity throughout your life and work. Just like our mascot rooster, Steve the Jerk. Hello, Be Awesome listeners. This is episode 79 of the Be Awesome podcast and your host here, Joshua Peach. Uh, We've got another great episode. Before we get to that, I do want to give those of you that are watching, you can see that the Be Awesome flag is back up on the wall, which means the flag that we auctioned off for episode 77 to Go to Veterans Path has found a home. Uh, Can't thank all of the supporters enough. The Be Awesome uh, followers, listeners, and guests that I've had that donated $22 or more to sponsor the episode 77. And then the flag that has actually auctioned off twice. Uh, we raised $2,500 to Veterans Path. So they got uh, $2,500 to help support our uh, active military transitioning into civilian life, be able to get mindfulness and meditation, free, free training and lessons uh, to help them on their path uh, back into the civilian world. So Thank you so much for all your support for that. That uh, was, was fantastic. So um, that said, episode 79, how did this episode come to fruition? Uh, I got a call from Jake and not State Farm Jake. This is a different Jake. And I got to tell you, if you're a business and you have uh, email lists and you have uh, contact points, checking in is absolutely vital and is never done. Uh, Jake reached out to me because I sat in a keynote uh, provided by uh, one of the associations that I'm a part of. And uh, Dr. Dean Kashawagi was the presenter. And I was in the audience, I'll never forget it. And I was working on a pretty complex um, sale that I was working through. And I felt like I had to have all the answers. I was frustrated. And here was this guy talking about his book, How to Know Everything Without Knowing Anything. I was like, just the title of the name, I gotta get the book to remind me that I don't need to know everything. Um, I, I can know everything without knowing anything. And so I went up and I, and I met Dr. Dean. We spoke for a few minutes. I bought his book and I signed up for his, his uh, email list. And so this was a couple of years ago. And I got, a, I got a cold call from a guy named Jake asking if I wanted to continue getting emails and to, wanted to tell me about some new programs that they had available. And uh, 30 minutes later, <laughs> we were talking about Be Awesome, the website, the podcast, selling t-shirts, everything else. And that night I get an email and says, hey, we've got Dr. Jacob and he's doing some really great stuff. He's written a couple of books. He might be a great fit for Be Awesome. Did a little bit of homework. And here we are, couldn't be more honored uh, for Dr. Jacob Kashawagi making some time for us. And we're gonna dig right into who you are, what you do and how you kind of see some things really focusing on our kids, which has really been a focus point for Be Awesome for the last couple months. So first and foremost, welcome to the Be Awesome podcast. Hey, thanks for having me here, Joshua. So let's, let's get a little bit of background. Dr. Dean, first of all, happens to be your dad. He does. So it's doctor, does. doctor family, yes. Yeah, so um, give, us, give us a little bit of history, who you are, what you're doing, and then we'll, I, want to, I want to get right into your books. Okay, so I'm actually a supply chain management consultant. Um, that's what I really do for business. And 
I, I used to teach at Arizona State University. They hired me to do research work. So we have a business process called the Best Value Approach. And so we help large organizations all over the world um, be able to become more efficient with the buying and selling of their services. And what ended up happening is um, while at the university, they didn't pay me to teach. They just paid me to do research, but I love to teach. And so I ended up starting to teach a course with my father who was working at the university. Um, I really went there to work with my father, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. And so it was kind of rare for a father and son to be working together, but we taught a class of um, honor students at Arizona State University. So the top 10% of students at ASU um, from every degree program would come into our class, about 250 of them a semester. And we would teach them the same principles that we're implementing in business. We were teaching them not only how to do business, but also how to apply them to their lives. And you know, that's, that's how Dr. Jake Gano is working with us, is he was a PhD student. He, it, it impacted him so much that he ended up joining our group, even though he was in another field. Mm -hmm. And he ended up wanting to change his career to teach high school students the same principles that he learned uh, because he found so much value in it. And of course, him and his partner, Alfredo Rivera, they won some competitions, started the Leadership Society of Arizona. And, um, and I, I've been volunteering my time and trying to help them to be able to make sure it's successful in helping uh, young students be able to grow up properly and successfully and happy and, and to be able to be happy in their life. Yeah, last one's a huge one. Happy is happy's tough to find right now, uh, you know, with everything that's going on in the world. And it's not just like this can go before COVID. The pressures that kids have today are far greater than they've ever been. Um, I, I, we've got a 13 year old and a two and a half year old. And, you know, I can, ex I can assume and expect that my, when my two and a half year old's 13, he's probably going to have even greater challenges, um, to be happy and not have such pressures on, uh, around, around him. Um, definitely. It, it, and it's because of the transparency of life now, you know, when, when you can at the, at your fingertips, wherever you are in the world be able to see what anybody is doing and the successes that everybody else around you is having. Mm -hmm. um, for a child who wants to grow up and be rich, famous, successful, do all the things that they see everyone else doing, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a lot to take in. Yeah, and it's, and it's, um, it's one of those things that it, it, it's for some people. I mean, I got to tell you, this, this sidebar story, have you ever heard of, I, I believe I saw that you have a child, a young one, Yes, uh, just about one years old. Okay, so um, boy or girl? It's a boy. So he's probably not watching YouTube videos. Um, our two and a half year old is hooked on Ryan's toy reviews. Have you heard of this? <laughs> I have not. This kid's nine years old. And basically what he and his parents do are daily toy reviews. 43 billion, 600 million views on YouTube. Wow. There's the thought that this kid is worth $120 million by doing <laughs> YouTube videos. So you sit there and you look and you go, well, anybody can do it. And in a way, I guess anybody can do it. It's a lot of luck right now with stuff like that. Uh, but there's still that hard work factor. And like you say, that, that it almost takes away like the, the, the social media, what people see. And that's yes. not what everybody, I mean, that's, that's all that's called the glitters isn't gold. I mean, it's easy to stand next to a really nice car and say it's yours um, and, and have a good life on, on, on social media, but it's probably a harder life than most would think. But perception-wise, what people think about it, it's what... And, it and what you have is other people are looking at these, this parent, these parents and this kid, mm -hmm. and they're thinking, now, my child, why aren't you doing the same thing? <laughs> you're, you're already 10 years old. Yeah. You know, why aren't you a YouTube star? <laughs> that was my conversation last night. <laughs> Come on, Danny. What's, go what's going on here? Why, why, why do we have 43 billion views? Um, but accepting, being accepting of what you have, what you are, and what you do, I think is huge because all things are not created equal, right? So um, that gets true. me, that gets us into the interest that I had out of the gate. I like when, when uh, Jake sent me, um, your, your information. I just kind of did a quick scan 
and I saw this book that you just released. So you've released two books, right? Yes, that's uh, correct. And your most recent one is No Influence Mentoring, Understanding Teenagers and Encouraging Their Success. Tell us about yes. that book. So really this book starts from my childhood. Um, because when I was a child, I grew up in a family of eight children. So Dr. Dean, my father, and, and my mother, um, Judy, um, they, they were traditional Japanese. You need to realize traditional Asian family is very rule oriented. When I was 10 years and younger, I was told when to eat, what to eat. If I didn't eat at the right time, then I didn't eat at all. That's the type of family that um, we grew up in, I grew up in for my younger years. And we had rules for everything in the summer. We had a rigorous academic program we had to follow. And that was created by my mother because we had to be the smartest kids in the school. And so it was a very, very structured family. But what ended up happening is Dr. Dean, uh, being an engineer and analytical, he started to look at, well, what's the performance of this model? And when my oldest brother was 19, my youngest brother was four years old, um, he looked at my oldest brother and said, you're, you're old enough to go be an adult now. What are you gonna do? And he saw like a blank stare and it, it scared it scared the heck out of him because he says here's my son he has no clue how to make his own decisions no clue on what he's going to do to add value in life and he was just really lost and so at that point when i was about 11 or 12 my father did something that no asian family usually ever does which is he eliminated all rules and he took a, a lesson from his mentor, which was Dr. Badger at the university, who had no rules except if you get into trouble, come find me so I can help you out of it. And that's what happened with my family. Um, I'm the fourth child of the eight. So about the middle of the family, mm -hmm. all of my younger siblings grew up in an environment with no rules, no punishments. At the time, if they didn't want to go to school, they didn't have to go to school. My parents would call the school and excuse them. They didn't want to, we were religious, so if they didn't want to go to church, didn't have to go to church anymore. Mm -hmm. um, they could believe whatever they wanted. And I had my youngest brother at four years old, was going out to the neighbor's house, playing with his friends, all the way till like six, seven o'clock at night. Nobody knew where this child was. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that was, absurd to, to all the older kids because six o'clock, five o'clock was when you had to come in. You, if you were ever late, you better call. And even then you'll probably, you're probably gonna get in trouble. So um, when I saw this change in my family and I saw that my parents, where their focus when I was younger was on the structure of the family and the family was more important and the organization was more important than the individual. As I start to grow up, I saw all my younger siblings raised in an environment where the individual was more important than the organization. That it was more important that the individual's needs are met and that they understood each child and they let each child figure out who they were instead of trying to force them into this structure um, for efficiency sake. Mm -hmm. And um, what we ended up finding out was Yes, my, my younger siblings did everything a parent would ever not want their children to do. Play <laughs> video games all day, waste their time, not be responsible. Um, some of them had a TV in their room. They watched TV all night, never going to bed, staying up early in the morning. But what we end up finding is instead of becoming spoiled, rotten, good for nothing brats like we all thought when they were young, mm. by the time they got into high school, my younger brother switched the TV out of his room for a desk so he could study. Nobody told him this, just did it. Started to comb his hair. Nobody told him this, he just did it. Started to actually try in school and really focus. By the time, even before they got out of high school, I was teaching at the university. I would actually uh, trust them more than my PhD students, than most of my PhD students. They were more um, intelligent, more responsible, more creative, more innovative in doing things that I needed than, than grown people. And, and so as I saw this, I, I started realizing something's wrong here. 
And during this time at the university, we start to change the dynamics of how we taught. What we told students now is, if you come to our class, you get an A. You just have to show up, we'll give you an A. This is an honors level course. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do any homework. You don't have to do really anything you don't want to do, just come to class. And we realized it's our responsibility as a mentor, as a teacher, to make sure if they just come, that they get something out of it. And what we ended up finding out is 95% of all the students who came to our class, they did the homework. They weren't required to, but they did it. And part of the reason is because we told them, your homework is to take what you learned from us talking and the, the activities we did and go back into your life, whatever field you're in, whatever you care about in your life and do something that makes you happier. Apply what we're teaching. If we are actually teaching you something of value, you can go back in your life very easily and apply it and become better, become happier, more successful. And it, it became one of the most popular classes at the university. If you didn't get on at 6 a.m. in the morning when pre-registration begins, you did not get one of those 250 slots. And it, it was an amazing thing to watch. So as, as I saw this model work, I told myself, oh my goodness, this whole time, what I thought college was about, what I thought education was about is totally off. We've been trying to tell students what to do, kind of like this model. Mm -hmm. But when you think about it, when parents are telling their kids what to do from a very young age, they're saying, do this, do that, directing them in every way. They go to school. Teachers are telling them what to learn, how to learn, when to learn. When someone for 21 to 25 years of their life is told what to do every moment, what is this child going to do when they get their freedom? They're going to wait for someone to tell them what to do because that's what they're used to. We're not growing leaders and innovative people. What we're doing is we're growing people who only know how to follow instructions. And, and that's one of the reasons why I, I think I wrote this book was I realized we were detrimenting so many people with this model mm -hmm. and I, I want to change it. That is, uh, that's, that's amazing. And I couldn't be more on board with you uh, with that, with, with everything that you're saying, I definitely was a, um, regimented, uh, rules in the house and, and I was hell on wheels for most of my adolescent life. I don't know if my, I don't know if my parents, <laughs> I don't know if my parents could have taken the same risk that, that your parents took, um, being the middle child, you know, you talked about the younger, talked a little mm -hmm. bit about the older, you know, being 11 or 12, what was that like for you? Was that, was that a hard adjustment for you? Uh, it was such a difficult adjustment for me because you need to realize even after 11 years of being in a rule oriented environment, I was used to it. Mm -hmm. And my natural nature was to be obedient. Mm -hmm. You know, my older siblings, they were pretty rebellious. And which was really funny is that I think they caused my parents more stress and headaches than my younger siblings did. Mm -hmm. Even though my younger, younger siblings, you know, they, they actually are the only ones who got caught by the police trying to walk on the roof of their elementary school, things like that. My, my older siblings caused my parents much more stress and grief. Mm -hmm. um, for me, middle child, hey, I was trying to help my parents. I love following the rules. Mm -hmm. And I realized one thing when I was young. As long as my parents told me what to do, I had no accountability. If things went wrong, my parents are to fault because they're the <laughs> ones who told me to do the darn thing. Yeah. And so if I didn't get good grades, if I didn't do anything, I mean, Hey, I'm, I'm scot free. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't have a care in the world because I'm not making the decisions. Other people are accountable for my life. Mm -hmm. But as soon as they release control and they said, no rules, do whatever you want. You're accountable for your own life. Now I got really worried because I wasn't used to being in that environment before. And for a couple of years, it was an adjustment for me to realize if I make this decision, then I got to live with these consequences. And it, it scared the heck out of me. Mm -hmm. um, my younger siblings were like, they're just overjoyed. I mean, because they're so young, they didn't know the difference. And yeah, they made mistakes, but they weren't really worried about it. They, mm -hmm. It was just natural to them because they were raised in an environment where they had their freedom, where they had accountability. 
and so they weren't afraid of 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 taking it you know listening to you i i i love the the relation with with accountability and being able to blame your parents i should have blamed them for some of my <laughs> some of my some of my stuff i guess but you know it's really interesting and i'm sure you you this is part of what's going what you have in your research but one of the things that we have a hard time with with our adults that are going into the workforce and getting out and having that freedom is they don't know how to handle accountability they don't know how to own their mistakes because probably i've never even thought about it until you just said this they've never had to have a, they've never had to own anything because they could push it off and say well i did what you what you asked me to do or i you know you were the one that was supposed to show me or i didn't know because you didn't teach me and so when they get into that point, and I have it all the time, you know, because I always tell people, especially the younger folks in the workforces, you, know, you can't fail fast enough. Just do do yes. what do the best that you can. If 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 something goes wrong, own it and move on. Once you say I'm sorry, nobody can they can't go any further than that. If you recognize it and own it, then there's nothing else that can be done there. But if yes. you don't, then people can just beat the heck out of you for as long as they want until you do own it. <laughs> but I think that listening to you, I'm sitting here saying, well, if we're putting all these rules and we're putting all these things in place and we're just going like that, then they don't have any idea until they go through a number of times where they're supposed to own it, where they go, ooh, this isn't anybody else's fault but my own. Um, yes. That's pretty, pretty powerful thinking about. Um, wow. People don't realize that making decisions and being accountable is a, it's not something that people can just say, hey, I'm accountable now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take responsibility now. It's a skill. It's something that actually has to be developed. And there are, there's tons of research out there to show this with children. Mm -hmm. But they show that when you allow a child to develop that skill when they're younger, everyone has to make mistakes. It's, it, it, everybody does. And, and they have to spend so much time learning how to deal with accountability and freedom. Mm -hmm. And so if you start them when they're young, the mistakes that they can make, one, are very minor because they don't have really any cares because they're not adults. Mm -hmm. and they have someone looking out for them. But two, you have a grown adult looking after them. You have two grown adults looking after them a lot of times. And so it's, very, it's a very safe environment to learn and to develop that skill. Mm -hmm. But if you don't let them develop that when they're young, then they develop it when they go to college. And when they get to college, there's a lot more money at stake for mistakes they make. Mm -hmm. they're, the impacts of their decisions, because they're now adults, it, it can be much more costly to their life. But also, there's no one watching over them, right? A kid making decisions at home and you're seeing what they're doing Versus a kid making mistakes in college. Nobody's watching out for your kid in college. They're in a dorm. Nobody's watching out. And they're probably getting advice from their friends who are equally inexperienced and likely to get into trouble with their decision making. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it only makes sense if you really want to raise someone who's going to be responsible, a leader, someone who's innovative, someone who's happy and successful. You got to start them when they're young. Let them develop that skill. Mm -hmm. So as parents, as you and I are, and many of my listeners are, um, and I'm sure you've had this conversation with your parents a number of times, because I'm sure that many people that are listening are going, this is crazy. You want me to, you want me to, you want me to take all of my guidebook away from my kids and give them freedom? You want me to, you want, wait a second, you want me to let them play video games or not go to school or not go to church or not go to, you know, whatever and be able to do well, you got to be crazy. I can't do that. And, and it's, uh, you know, for parents to think about releasing that in, and we have a very loose household as far as that goes. Like our oldest son has been able, we've never forced him. We, we well, I <laughs> take it back. We've, I, I, I str suggested strongly early on that he play some sports and, and, uh, found very quickly that there, the sports that I suggested strongly, he didn't like. And so then we went with a, whatever it is that you want to do that you're going to be passionate about that you're going to go through the whole you know from if you start it you got to finish it um will support that um in a very in a you know a very loose way um where a lot of parents you know force 
you know, we got to be doing five sports. We're going to be doing this, this, and this. And you, that, you think that's what the kids love. Um, and they might. Some kids do. Um, but, you know, we're very loose with, I mean, we, we definitely have a couple of things. But there's no um, punishments and groundings. And if you don't do this. Uh, um, but, you know, a lot of parents have to have, the, for their own sake and their own sanity, it's more the parents that have to have this regimen, right? Yes. Um, what was it like for you? I'm sure you've had this conversation with parents. How hard was it for them to, to uh, or easy was it for them to, to, to initiate this? And then what, would, what, what did they say, like, over the course of time as mistakes? Did they ever have second – did you ever say – did you ever ask them, like, hey, did you guys ever have second thoughts and what was an example of that? Or were they just, like, steadfast and said, hey, we're in it. We're going we're gonna to ride this thing out. And we're going to not worry about it. it all the time. They, they always had second thoughts on this thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I know this very well because um, because I was old enough at the time and I was kind of the most responsible person at the time in my family as siblings. Mm -hmm. um, I actually supported my father in trying to keep this going. It's one of the few times that I think my father almost got a divorce because of the stress in the house mm -hmm. with everyone, eight kids, all doing what they wanted. Mm -hmm. and, and so I actually had to be like a buffer to protect mm -hmm. my younger siblings when my father would come home everything's in a mess and mm -hmm. he's just about to break and tell everyone they have to do everything again tell him hey don't worry about it you know we, we can do this together and and just give it time you'll see that everyone's going to turn out really well mm -hmm. I, I mean at the time i didn't even know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but i like the idea of letting people have their freedom and especially when i was a kid hey yeah. this idea of freedom is is a good thing so all the time, you know, and one time I, my father came home, my younger brother had friends over, they played dodgeball in the house. One of their friends body slammed another friend into a wall and there's an indentation in one of our walls. And my father asked my youngest brother, what happened here? And my younger brother looked at and says, whoa, I don't even know how that happened. <laughs> oh, my, my father was not happy at all. But, but to not punish him, to, to let him just go about mm -hmm. and, and, and to see what happens because he made a dent in the wall and, and how difficult it was to fix and the money it costed, mm -hmm. um, it's really an amazing thing that my brother actually started to be more aware um, mm -hmm. because of it. But it is, it is a crazy thing mm -hmm. to, to let children, you know, be able to have their freedom. Um, it's a, it, it is a crazy thing to, to think about. But mm -hmm. I'm not saying don't have rules. Mm -hmm. in, in my book, it, there's a lot to this. But what I'm really saying is when you're mentoring someone, you're parenting a child, you're teaching a child, the child is more important than you are. And there's a couple of things to consider here. First is realizing that if you have a company, plain logic is the more management you have, the less skilled your workers need to be. Because they have people governing them. As soon as you take away the management, mm -hmm. now every single worker that's coming to your environment have to be, has to be more skilled. They have to be better. Because there's no one to, there's no you know, fallback. And, and this is exactly the same way with, with raising children. Mm -hmm. The more you do as a parent, then the less skilled your children will be. The more you do for your children and for your students, then the less your students have to do. And it, it means they'll be less skilled. It means if they do less, it means they don't develop themselves as much. If they don't develop themselves as much, it means as they get onto the world, they're go going to be more fearful. They're going to be more afraid. And so the first thing you need to realize is a concept of the more you let your children do, and the more freedom you give them, the more skilled they're going to be. Mm -hmm. The second thing is they're only children. So what you're doing is you're trying to figure out who is your child mm -hmm. and then supporting them as the adult because you're wiser, you know, you have more experience. So you know, once you find out who they are, you know what things you can do. You can be more creative. You, can, you have more resources so that you can actually help them in who they are. Right. And so it's not just, hey, go out on your own. I'm not going to do anything for you anymore. It's actually for for the parent and adult. It's a much more difficult model. 
because you actually, you have to one, watch them make their mistakes, but two, you have to find creative ways to help them in who they are, not try to make them something else, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of parents will say, well, what's wrong with my mentality of making them responsible, da, 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 da. And the reality of it is, because usually adults assume they know everything, but they don't know anything. Mm -hmm. And as you start to see reality, you start realizing there's more than one way to skin a cat in the world. Meaning you find that you don't have to be a certain way to be successful. Throughout history, you found people who don't know how to read become multi-billionaires. You have people who aren't responsible, don't know the last thing about cleaning their room or the first thing about cleaning their room, let alone being able to, to have a clean office space or whatnot. And you have these people making tons of money and being really successful. You have people with all sorts of mental diseases and whatnot. They become very successful in uh, comedy and in business and all sorts of things. And so whatever a parent is thinking in their mind that my child needs to know these things, more than likely they're wrong. Um, and that's why you should never try to shape your child because what's going to make someone more successful? Someone who does what they're good at or someone who does something that they're not good at? Mm -hmm. And obviously, the person who does what they're good at is always going to be more successful in life. So it's only to your benefit as a parent to let your child figure out who they are, who they want to be, and what they're good at, um, not what you think they should be good at. You know, you have people like Caesar Milan made millions off of walking dogs. So the next time I hear a parent say, video games, that you can't make a successful career out of video games. You're wrong. Yes, you can. In fact, there are many people who that's all they do all their life and they make millions mm -hmm. off of playing video games. And, and so it's, it's a changing world. And so that's something that parents have to be aware of is that your child will be most successful when they figure out who they are and they do what they're good at. Yeah, that's uh and that and that takes work on all fronts, right? It takes the work <laughs> it takes it takes the work to to encourage and 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 give freedom to to try things and then it takes um letting your own feelings down of how we were raised, you know, and that's it's breaking the cycle. Your dad broke the cycle, right? He generations yes. and generations um had historically done and raised this way and it worked right it didn't it, it, yes it, in, in their in their opinion it wasn't broken it takes yes. a whole lot of letting your guard down and <laughs> a whole lot of hope that, <laughs> that that you're gonna do something completely different and have a better result and yes it but nowadays, you know, parents don't have to be as worried because there's actually starting to be a lot of research on this. Right. And um, there's, there's starting to be a lot of tools and, and resources available now um, mm -hmm. for parents who actually do want to make this move. That's the hardest part about all of this because we have never been, and I shared with you, you and I met for the first time two minutes before we went live on this, um, but I shared with you my education background or lack of educational background. Um, and thankfully for me, at my, I'm, at my age, in my mid forties, I'd be lost without Google or I'd be lost without LinkedIn or the technology yes. and the tools that I can, I can be the smartest guy in the room. Thanks to these search tools and all of this information. The biggest challenge that I see is for people to find the right information because there's so much to help them yeah. be comfortable and make those decisions. Um, and that's what we're trying to do, you know, with this, I think everybody should go out and buy your books to at least start and then yes. start to look at that research and start to look at those, those trends that are, that are changing, um, yes. and evolving, you know, from, um, you know, I mean, how long, how long has it been that we've had classrooms set up with single lane desks that everybody's <laughs> got to walk in, everybody's got a single file looking forward to the desk. And now we're just starting to do yes. collaborative desks and set settings. And now we're, in some places we're taking away desks. Um, and now with remote learning, teaching these kids how to learn differently through remote learning, it's just, it's a whole bunch of, of different yes. things. Um, well, well, you know, it's an interesting thing, the change of education. Because education was originally built to try to do two things. 
teach technical skills, and two, help children memorize information that wasn't readily available. But because of technology and the, cell, and the smartphone, those two reasons are obsolete. You no longer need to memorize anything. In fact, what they find out is even after college, 80% of everything a student learns is outdated. And the 20% that wasn't, they're gonna be retaught that in the industry anyway, when, when they get onto the workforce. Or they can look it up on their cell phone. Um, yeah. They have access to the brightest minds all over the world at their fingertips for free. And mm -hmm. a lot of parents are wondering, why does my child not take school seriously? Well, the reason why is because children are children, but they're not dumb. Right. They know when a teacher is giving them busy work. They know when what they're learning has nothing to do with their success and what they really want to do when they grow up. And what happens in school nowadays is 90% of the time at school, in my opinion, is obsolete. They don't really have to do what they're doing at school. All the work they're doing, most of it, obsolete. And um, Google is showing that now. Google has just released their education, which is you don't have to go to college anymore. You can in six months learn everything you need to learn, and then we'll hire you in 50 of some of the greatest companies in the US. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. So now this four year degree that costs anywhere from you know 100 to like 400, 500,000, depending on what school you go to, this degree is obsolete. Mm -hmm. And um, it's only going to be more and more like this, and it's going to get into the high school arena. Um, and, and it's it's really a crazy thing to to, to watch. Yeah, I, I talked to a robotics company uh, not too long ago, and they donate their robots. Their, you know, they donate robots to schools for the kids to work on, with the idea that when they get out of school, they're going to be fully functional, capable, being able to work on and and design and build the yes. robots that are in the workforce and in, in places I've, I've heard, I haven't, I didn't see, but I think it was in China. They actually have robots that are in bank, uh, bank financial institutions that are actually, you know, helping with transactions and doing things. Yes. Um, and that's, you know, forward thinking. I've, I've mentioned the video a couple of times in podcasts, the video shift happens, which was done in like 2007. I'm not sure if you've, I'm, sh I'm sure you've seen it. It's been seen a, a bazillion times. If you haven't, check it out, YouTube, yeah. Shift, Shift Happens. Shift Happens. Basic, basically, it showed, it showed a series of factoids um, in 2007, and it said, I, I don't know the exact factoid it was, but it basically said that, that um, a certain high percentage of kids that entered their freshman year in college in 2007, by the time they got out of college, the technology that they were using, learning, back then it was Java, like who talks about Java today, right? So it would be obsolete. So all the things that you go to school for and you learn, for most occupations, by the time you graduate four years later, it's obsolete. And that's how fast the world is yes. moving. And it's, it's hard as parents or people that are of a certain age, probably, I would say 35, 36 or older, to wrap their head around it. I mean, again, I'm in my mid forties. I graduated in the early nineties, high school. My yeah. computer class was a typewriter, right? So when you think about such a short <laughs> amount of time, when you're talking about 25 years, it was just yes. a short 25 years ago that, that computer lab was actually type, typing class. How many WPM, how many words per minute can you type? And there was really no vision on what was possible with technology. And here we are, like you say, um, with all of this at our fingertips, I, I do keynotes a lot where I say, my dad is, was, my dad was always smarter than me all the way up through until, you know, probably up until recently. And the reason being was he read a ton. He read every newspaper in the morning. He, he, yeah, he probably memorized encyclopedias and dictionaries. And the only way wow. that you could get information back then, um, was encyclopedias, dictionaries, in the library or a books or a bookstore <laughs> yeah. and you had to work hard at it. Right. Um, yes. and with, I mean, we'll give this example. I spent five minutes, right? I didn't know who you were. I got an email. Hey, do you want Dr. Jacob on your podcast? I immediately do a scan. And in five minutes, I know your background. I know where you went to school. I know where you worked. I've got seven podcasts up here. I've got YouTube videos. I've got a whole <laughs> bunch. I, I've got almost, 
I've got almost so much information. It's too much. Yes. And, and that is, that is the key. Now there's only one skill that parents need to worry that their children are developing. And that skill is the ability to improve and change. Mm -hmm. That is it. And I always tell parents, look, if even if your child loves video games, if they learn how to become a better video game player every single day, and they learn how to improve very quickly at something, well, that same skill is the same skill you need to become the best lawyer or the best doctor or the best engineer. If your child knows how to quickly improve and change, that is what, that's the skill that's needed for this future. Because society is so is changing so rapidly now. If you can't change, you're, you're going to be obsolete in the matter of years. If you don't know how to continually improve, then you can't shift. You can't even make the change if you can't get into an area and quickly know exactly how to improve in that area. And change in anywhere is the same. Mm -hmm. It's always looking ahead, figuring out what is the next step for me to become better at what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And everything else is details. That skill is the only thing I think that really a child needs to develop in their younger ages. Mm -hmm. I've seen many people do nothing for 20, 30 years of their life, but because everything they did, they, they learned how to improve and, and to become better, whether it's just like going on vacation or whether it's, you know, being able to watch YouTube videos the quickest right? And, and, and do things like that. When that child figures out at 30 what they want to do, in the matter of years, they become very successful. Mm -hmm. and, and so, and I've seen this a lot in, in many students. So for a parent, you know, one of the things that will help you to be able to let the child develop on their own is to realize that they no longer need all this information. They no longer need this technical information. What they need is a smart child, a child who knows how to change, a child who knows what to look for, right? Now you got so much information. If the child is used to memorizing, then it's going to overwhelm them. It's going to stress them out. It's going to confuse them. And they're going to get all sorts of mental diseases, which you see in all of our children today, mm -hmm. right? But if your child knows how to quickly look at a lot of information, say, this is what I care about. This is what I need. Mm -hmm. This is how I'm going to improve myself. Then your child is set for their future. And, um, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I think is missed in education. The only thing that they really need to know is not usually taught to mm -hmm. students. What do you think about, um, and what was your, when the rules, when the rules changed when you were 11 or 12, because I'm guessing with the rules, there was, Please, thank yous, Mr. Mrs. Rule, you know, the proper way to socialize or be social as a child yeah. in every situation. Um, how important, it, you know, were, the, were those pieces still kind of in play? Was it already ingrained in you? You see, one of the things that I see that is challenging, and, I, and I'm, I'm guilty. I, I use my, I look at my phone too much. I look at my yeah. computer too much. I, I don't, I, you know, sometimes I just, I'll look up I try, and I try to do a much better. Fortunately, my fiance could go days without looking at her phone and, and her interaction with our kids be, is, is, is amazing. And, and I'm a work in progress, but you know, I think the, one of the challenges that I see is, is our kids having a hard time to understand socialization like you and I are having even remotely face to face, right? Opposed to yes. screen to screen. Um, what do you, what are your thoughts on that? And what, what, what are some best practices or what do you, what do you, what do you, what have you seen? Uh, I always tell people, um, whether it's people skills or leadership, it's the same thing. And you cannot teach leadership in a classroom. Same thing with socializing. You cannot teach socializing by lecturing to someone. Mm -hmm. The only way to help students and children develop socialization skills, learn how to deal with other people, is they have to do it. So instead of trying to tell your children what to do, instead of trying to get them to go to classes to learn about it, what the parents need to do is create opportunities where their children can socialize. And this involves a couple of things. One, 
it's being smart enough to realize where are the social groups, making friends, right? A lot of times parents want their children to make friends, but their parents don't have friends, right? And, and the more friends actually you, the parent, have, then the more children your, your children can be around. And, and so one is, as a parent, you have to actually develop that as well so that you can create the opportunities for your children to socialize. Second is you need to know who your child is because your children won't be able to socialize with everyone at first. They're gonna need to find someone like them, right? If, if they're kind of like, you know, someone who's all into video games, they're not gonna be comfortable maybe around someone who is like really physical into football and karate and, and you know, whatever else. You're gonna to have to find someone that your child's personality, their, you know, what they like to do meshes with. And, and a lot of times it's the opposite way of round that we look at it. Mm -hmm. I'm the parent, you're gonna hang out with the people that I want you to hang out with. But in reality, it needs to be, I need to as a parent find people that my child is willing and feels comfortable to socialize with at first mm -hmm. because they're just developing it. And then as they develop that, they'll be more comfortable to reach out to more and more diver diverse people. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? makes a ton of sense and again it goes to that whole comfort level of the parent the parents <laughs> too often they're comfortable with their friends their friends have kids they all have kids around the same time if they've had their friends for a long time or neighbors or whatever that's their comfort zone so why not put their kids in their comfort zone because it's easier yes. um, and then My, you're in that you're in that boat and then you're a couple of years in and you realize that they don't like each other and it's it's a do-over my my dad always used to say when he saw parents when their child brings home their friends and the parent says, those, those friends are no longer allowed in our house. They're not good. Send them away. And my, my dad always said, what that parent is telling their child is, child, I don't like who you are. Mm -hmm. Because the child went and found people that they feel comfortable with. Right. And so as soon as you send them away, you're telling the child, what you feel comfortable with and who you are is not something I like. And it's, it's not the right message. Mm -hmm. But um, if you can switch that around, you can give your child more confidence and help them develop the skills that they need to. Yeah. And they're figuring it out. They're figuring it out on their own. Again, that's that whole, you know, accountability. You, you, your, your parents give you a, a set of friends through their friends and you go out and get in trouble. You go on <laughs> like, your, like your brother did and climb on the roof of the elementary school. Then you, yeah. there's no accountability there. Well, you made me hang out with him. He's trouble. <laughs> now you finger point the blame all over the place. So it's, it's, it's a yes. per perfect, uh, it's perfect stuff. Well, yes. I, I got to tell you, I think we covered a whole lot of bases here. Uh, I could do a whole nother, I could do a whole nother podcast with you on your first book because we didn't even touch that, uh, <laughs> which is In Search of Truth, Five Stress-Free Steps to Discover Who You Are, Where You're Going, and How to Get There. Um, it, uh, you know, um, the latter book was, was on the development of children because I saw that important need. Mm -hmm. But that first book, In Search of Truth, um, that was, I, I wrote that book because I, I want to give back. Uh, when I was growing up, when I was younger, I was taught one very important thing in life, and I wanted to be able to pass that forward. The, most, the one thing that made me the most successful and has allowed me to become the happiest and, and, and I think, you know, the, be able to achieve what I've done is this one idea. And it's, it's a lot more than this, but I'll, I'll give you this kind of like, like preview into it. It's what is outside is more important than what's in your mind. The more you understand reality, the easier like your life will be, the quicker you will learn, the, the less stress you will go through. But the more you think and you stay in your head, then the more difficulty you're going to run into. Mm -hmm. And and so that's what that book is about is, you know, in, instead of thinking you're always right, no, it doesn't matter what you think. You can think a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And yes, your opinion matters, but it doesn't mean it's right. It doesn't mean it's accurate, I should say. Right. And, um, and the reality of it is if you don't know what's outside, if you don't see reality, then you're going to be running into a lot of walls, right? Yeah. You're walking through a home. If you don't actually see what's there... Yes, you, it could cause you a lot of pain trying to get from one side of house to another. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's a, uh, something a lot of us 
have a hard time with is is understanding reality outside of our head. Um, I'm gonna tell you it's what, difficult. I'm, I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read both your books, and I might invite you back if you <laughs> if you want to come back for a second second go around. We can do we can do a, a book club uh, episode. This was fantastic. Uh, I couldn't. No, have thanks. Asked for thanks for having me on. I, I've enjoyed myself. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. New friends. Uh, just <laughs> j- j- th- and thank and thank Dr. Jake. I didn't even know that he was a doctor too, but Dr. Jake for putting this all together. It, that was. This is something that I, I try to share with people is, you know, it's really important for us to open our eyes uh, and open our ears and, and see what's around us. And, you know, Dr. J caught me at a moment. It was funny. He called. It was probably 12, 12. It was, I think it was 12 o'clock, my, my, my 12 o'clock. And, uh, you know, we went 30 seconds. And he's like, hey, just want to make sure you want to stay on the mailing list. And I said, you know what? I haven't read Dr. Dean's book in a couple of years since I, since I got it. Uh, it was vital in the pro- project, which, by the way, I made the sale. Um, and and it, was, it was vital in making the sale and, and getting my head uh, in a right mindset, even with the title. So I got to find the book. And then we got into this dialogue, and it was just amazing. And um, it was because he was interested, and he opened his ears. And I opened my eyes to say, hey, you know, this he has to be a good guy because he's tied to Dr. Dean. And then when he sends me this email <laughs> about Dr. Jacob, I go, well, this is a this is perfect. Let's put it all together. So, I appreciate the opportunity. Really appreciate the things you're doing. Keep keep going. I, I love Thank the you. fact that you're, you know, this this um, effort that just started with teaching with your dad uh, and building this program and finding this research of people getting things done um, because you're giving them something to start, which is a great a great idea. Um, you know, to, to say, Hey, you show up to class, you get an A now, now get to work. Um, you gotta, you gotta be here to win. I think that's fantastic. So, um, how can people get a hold of you? How can people learn more? I'll put all the links for your books on Amazon. I, that's probably the best way for them to, to get it. But, uh, that'd be great. If you could put this, the leadership society of Arizona's website on there, yeah. the it's leadaz.org. That's the best way if you, if you need help with your child or if, if you're just interested in this new way of developing um, children, students, um, go to the website. Everything's up there as well. Um, if you have any questions for me, if you ever need anything, you can also put my email. It's jacob.k at leadaz.org. Perfect. Well, enjoy the heck out of your one-year-old. Uh, they definitely don't see you blink your eyes and, uh, you got a long beard like this and they're 13 and have all the answers. So, uh, and- it's been great. I, I've really enjoyed it and it yeah. does go quick. It, he was just born yesterday. It seems. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. And, uh, really appreciate the insight. This has been great. And I think that the, the people that, uh, that listen to this and, and might be on the fence or thinking about you know, what's going on. And there, I don't think there's a better time than now for people to really kind of dig and look at, you know, what it is that they want for, for, for an outcome. And the outcome is we want, we want our kids to be the best that they can possibly be. Um, and sometimes you have to let go to, to let that happen. And uh, uh, really appreciate the message, my friend. Great to meet you and uh, appreciate your time here today. No, thank you, Joshua. That will do it for this episode. Powerful stuff. I have really fell, fallen into this great time of talking to folks about education, especially our kids, which, you know, it's more yes. important now than ever to really get a handle on. I got to tell you that the staggering statistic that I had on the episode with Gaggle and Jeff uh, Patterson was that out of 4 million students that they protect just in the first part of this year before COVID, there were over 60,000 recorded uh, potential kids with either anxiety or depression. So it's yeah. out there. It's it's out there. It's scary. And we've got to equip our kids as best as possible. And that's not by just coddling them and, you know, pushing them. It's it's by understanding and embracing and, and looking at maybe doing things a little bit differently. So I'm hoping to have a couple more episodes here to, to help gu- guide us through this with the reopening of schools. Um, yes. Really appreciate everybody's efforts and helping support be awesome and the be awesome uh efforts to veterans path as well as purchasing uh our be awesome shirts uh keep keep it up thank you can't thank you enough um we'll be talking to you real soon so if you can be anything be awesome